We talk Critical Role and the Matt Mercer Effect, today on Dungeon Graph. Welcome to Dungeon Craft. I'm Professor Dungeon Master, coming to you from Dungeon University, wearing my plus two vest of protection. And this channel is about playing the ultimate game of D&D and other tabletop role-playing games. And I'm Deathbringer. Level up your game by subscribing and click the bell icon so you'll be informed when we upload new videos every week. The Matt Mercer effect has been the topic of innumerable YouTube videos. And in case you've been living under a rock, Matt Mercer is the host of a very popular streaming show about Dungeons and Dragons called Critical Role. The show is immensely popular and has brought tons of new fans into the Dungeons and Dragons tent and introduced them to the game. I remember when every role-playing game book came with an obligatory how to play section. Thanks to Critical Role, how to play a role-playing game is super clear and now we have a lot more players enjoying the game. But the Matt Mercer effect is the idea that he's such a good DM that he becomes this impossible standard and, and people learning how to play the game expect their dungeon master to have the same sort of skills and be at the same level Matt is and that's not really realistic. I've even experienced the Mercer effect myself. The last Gen Con I attended, my brother-in-law said to me, hey, did you hear Matt Mercer is here? I don't know if you know who he is. He does the same thing that you do, only he's really good. So today I'm gonna analyze Matt, his play style, how he runs the game, analyze his players, and then give you my general observations. Full disclosure, to research this episode, I watched Campaign 2, Episode 136, Hell or High Water, and took notes. As a DM, Matt Mercer is terrific. Only a real hater can say differently. He is prepared and organized. Everything he needs is at his fingertips. His descriptions are terrific. He can act. He can do accents and voices. He reacts well to the players. He really listens to his players and maintains eye contact. And he's impartial. He doesn't seem to fudge the dice. It's no surprise that Matt is a professional actor and actors have professional training. They have a talent stack that includes a lot of reading, a lot of writing, observing people very carefully, listening to people, maintaining eye contact, and being able to describe an emote. I take issue with the idea that Matt Mercer sets an unattainable bar. It is possible to obtain that high level of DM skill, but you have to put in the hours. Malcolm Gladwell in his book Outliers observes that it takes about 10,000 hours of doing anything to become an expert. And Matt Mercer has put in that time. He's just not naturally gifted. I think he's really worked at it. Not every Game Master can achieve the level of skill that Matt does when it comes to doing voices and sound effects, but you can try. And these are five things you can learn. One, be organized. Practice your descriptions. Avoid saying, um, uh, um, if you watch Matt's eyes as he's doing descriptions, you'll see he mostly maintains eye contact with his players and he occasionally glances down. That's because he has prepared and he has rehearsed these descriptions and is only relying on them just a minor amount. And you can do this too. You just have to do a little rehearsing before the game. Watch this description. You descend the stone staircase into a chamber of antediluvian antiquity. Your flickering torchlight reveals two passages, one to your left and the other to your right. Both are littered with gnawed human bones. Which do you choose? See how I did that without a cut? Glancing down? That's because I rehearsed it before this episode. It's a skill that anyone can build over time. Two, Matt is a great listener. He's present and in the moment. When his players speak, they get his full attention. He understands the DM's job is not to act, but to react to the players. He's not flipping through books. He's not planning three sessions ahead. He's focused like a laser on the current moment. Three, he doesn't know every rule, and that's okay. At one point, he calls for an evasion check, and he asks his players, is that wisdom or dexterity? And they tell him it's dexterity. Knowing the rules is actually not the most important aspect of being a DM. It's true, you have to know the rules to an extent that you can, you can run the game, but you don't know everything and it's impossible to do so. I saw a panel discussion with Matt and Matt Coville and Mike Merles and Mercer was talking about how he didn't really understand how to play 3E, but he was game mastering anyway. And he just had his players roll under their ability scores with a D20. So you want to hit something with a sword, uh, make a strength check. You want to shoot something with a bow, make a dexterity check. And that's actually how the game The Black Hack 
handles all situations. So Matt didn't know the rule, but that's not as important as keeping to the spirit of the rule and keeping the game moving. Four, practice doing silly voices, accents, and sound effects. Back in the day, I had a game master who was great at doing accents, and he was a librarian, and, and this was before the internet. He actually had a book that he, he took out of the library and he lent to me, and we learned how to do accents together just by reading them. But now you have the advantage of watching YouTube, and you could just listen to people. And with a little practice, the next time your players meet a nobleman, he can speak in an English accent. Or create a demon that sounds like Jack Nicholson. Or dwarfs with Russian accents. Or a bar that looks like Keith Richards. Rock and roll, mate. And I never took an acting class. I just practice a lot, and I'm not afraid to look silly, which I think is a prerequisite for any DM. And five, let the dice tell the story. Matt doesn't fudge his die rolls. If someone takes massive damage, they take massive damage. He doesn't pull his punches. I admire that. Now let's look at Matt's players. This is what I observed. They're warm and friendly. Nobody shows up late and starts eating Subway or starts talking about work or their kids. They don't interrupt or talk over one another. They're trained actors who know how to improv. And improv means knowing when to let others have the spotlight and have their moment. They don't interrupt the DM or undermine him. Like when he pauses for an extra beat during the descriptions, as game masters often do, they don't jump in and say, I slapped the innkeeper in the face. Just kidding. Like they allow Matt some space so that he can remain in the zone. They joke even at Matt's expense, but they don't get carried away and they keep it focused on the game. There's no redundancy in their characters. I'm looking at their classes. Wizard, rogue, barbarian, cleric, monk. That's a good distribution. It's not like everyone in the party is a half tabaxi, half dragonborn barbarian bard. They have character voices, so it's easy for the game master to distinguish whether they're in or out of character. They make decisions quickly, so the other players aren't kept waiting. They don't stop the entire game to look up rules. They do look up rules, but if you watch them, they do that while someone else is taking their turn so it doesn't slow down the game. And finally, they see the DM as a collaborator, not an adversary. My analysis of these players is they are not normal. They're better than normal. In a typical role-playing game, a player is portraying a character, and the audience is each other. In this game, the participants are actors playing the role of a player playing a role of a character. And their audience is the audience out there, not just each other. The players on Critical Role are the reason Matt Mercer can be Matt Mercer. They make him look good. They're producers of the show. They're making money. They have a financial interest in seeing Matt succeed and not look like an ass. And that's the biggest difference between Critical Role and a normal game of D&D. I mean, your players are probably nuts. They can be argumentative, obnoxious, rude. They deliberately screw up your plans. They cheat. And they want you to be Matt Mercer? They're lucky you show up. So more observations and differences, and these are not meant as negative criticisms. They are things that I would do differently, and I'm sharing to illustrate that different DMs do do things differently, and that's okay. Matt's got seven players. That's a huge group. I recommend, especially if you're new, you only run groups of three to four players. That way, everybody gets adequate attention. If you play with six to seven, your players really have to be experts at the game who take their turns quickly and efficiently and understand the concept that others are waiting. I think three to four players is the ideal amount for most groups because it allows everyone to engage in some character development and role playing and, and they don't have to split up the spotlight between so many people. The critical role characters are 15th level and that's an outlier. According to D&D Beyond, 90% of campaigns end before the characters reach 10th level. Again, to run a high-level campaign, you need to be an expert DM with expert players. I recommend the D&D Essential set, which takes characters up to 6th level. I think 7th level is where D&D gets a little wonky and starts to slow down. I think that if you want to play higher levels than that, you probably are, would be well served by running a couple of campaigns to 6th level, and if your players want to go, then you could reach those aspirational levels. Personally, I don't like playing high-level campaigns because I feel that the characters are just too powerful. Like, I'm looking at some of the hit points here, 183, 146, 161. To me, that's a lot of hit points. I was watching Questing Beast recently, and they interviewed Mark Diaz Truman of Magpie Games, and he made this great analogy with hit points. It's like, you got a bunch of glass beads on a kitchen table. Imagine you got a 160 
60 glass beads. Those are your hit points. And you got 160 beads, and every time you're hit, you lose 10 to 20 beads, and then the cleric gives you beads back. You know, and there's just all these beads moving across the table, and it's tough for me to be frightened knowing I can lose 70 beads and I still have like 80 or 90 of them left. It just feels kind of safe. It lacks danger. In researching this episode, I came across a new vocabulary term, permadeath, as in there's been an, this many deaths in Critical Role so far, but only one permadeath. In my game, death is permadeath. No one is resurrected, nobody comes back. When you die, you're dead. I also wouldn't allow Travis to play a dual class warlock paladin, but I'm the dungeon master, I can change the rules. And that's one thing Matt and I definitely agree on. He changes rules all the time. He allows players to re-roll their hit points when they level up, if they roll a one. I would never allow that, and that's not actually in the rules. But that's okay, he's the dungeon master. Being the dungeon master gives you the ability to change any rule you want. So don't be afraid to put the master in Dungeon Master and tell your players no if you don't like multi-classing or you don't like certain optional rules from Tasha's Cauldron. Don't use them. Do what's easiest for you. Unlike Matt Mercer, you're not being paid. Your players should be thankful you are showing up to run the game. Watching Matt Mercer run D&D is a lot like watching Tom Brady throw a football. Unless you're a total hater, you gotta admire the technique. He inspires me to raise my game, and I think DMs can learn a lot by watching him. And your players can learn a lot by emulating his players. They are respectful, considerate, they know the rules, and they take their turns quickly and don't hog the spotlight. Now, my players are probably more like your players, and if you want to see them play the game, you can sign up for Patreon, link below. Also below is a link to McDeath, one of my scenarios, available at questgivers.com. And if you want to improve your narration, don't go away. Check out this video over here. I'll see you there, and may all your rolls be 20. Deathbringer again. Mercer, the one thing Critical Role needs is Deathbringer. I'm open to negotiations. This dweeb only pays minimum wage and I carry the whole show. While I'm waiting for him to call back, click on this video for more dungeon craft.